bill, you will see the numbers of the participants growing as we move. Yeah, I got it. Right. Yes, it starts to build up. See below. Oh, Piman is with us. Hey, Piman. Yes. Piman. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Great. And? Yep. I just got him. Okay. He just said he was in. <laughs> Not with audio, anyway. Piman, unmute. Hey, Piman. Mike. Oh my God! What's going on, man? This is, this is, this is like a, I don't know how many hoops I've had to jump through. I'm am so sorry, Bill. This is uh, this is amazing. Okay, so let me let me uh, go ahead and introduce Bill. Uh, just one sec. I gotta get my stuff together here. The audio is a little bit uh, choppy for me uh, from you. Payment is that? Uh, anyway, I don't know. If oh, it is. Well, now it's a little better. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's better now. All right. So, um, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and in introduce you. So, Bill Bill Freeman is the uh, Thomas and Gerd Perkins Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, uh, where he was the Associate Department Head from 2011 to 14. He's also a Principal Scientist in Google Research and a valued colleague of mine. I'm proud to say, um, and he's worked there since 2015. Um, his research interests include computer vision and computational photography. His collaborations have received five best paper awards and three test of time awards in computer vision and machine learning conferences. And in 2019, he received the uh, PAMI Distinguished Researcher Award, uh, the highest award in computer vision. I feel like Bill doesn't really need introduction, so I'll keep it short. Uh, and that's it. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor, Bill, please. And sorry again for all the trouble. No, no problem. Um, thanks so much for the kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, to give this talk. I'm, I'm very happy with it. So, the title is "Feathers, Wings, and the Future of Computer Vision Research." Um, the The first point I want to make is a disclaimer that this is a, a cartoon depiction of the true story. And so, like, what's a cartoon? A cartoon is is um, is like a picture, but it it hides things from the picture. It hides details. It might hide uh, important aspects, but it, but it just tells the main part that the speaker wants to use to con convey the story. And that's, that's how I want you to look at this talk. It's, it's missing details. It's not completely accurate, but it, it kind of uh, is an exaggeration to make a point. So here in that spirit, here is uh, a sort of cartoon picture of how computer vision papers were generated in the past, say, six, six, seven years. So um, it seems, you know, that we've obviously had this deep learning revolution. And uh, from an outside, from a, a distant point of view, you might think that the way computer vision papers have been generated in the past six years is to uh, take the Forsyth and Ponce computer vision standard textbook, open it to a random page, look at the subject of that page and put the word deep in front of that subject, then um, as the title, then collect a relevant data set, train a CNN modeled after AlexNet, VGG or ResNet to address that task, and then look at the results, post on archive, publish in CVPR. Now that's obviously a cartoon picture of how papers were generated. But in some sense, it's like a, it's kind of like a Gaussian model, you know, you know, it's not exactly right, but it nonetheless gives you intuition and, and lets you reason about things uh, that might be helpful. So let's, let's kind of see where we can go with this. For one thing, there's actually, you can argue, there's a little bit of evidence supporting this model, which is to say, you can go to Forsyth and Ponce, the table of contents, and just select random uh, topics from them and Google deep that topic, CVPR, and see what you get. So here's, here's what happens if you do that. Uh, texture might be some topic that you pick randomly out of the table of contents. Of course, there's a deep texture paper. Uh, epipolar geometry, unsupervised deep epipolar flow, deep st structure from motion, deep non-rigid structure from motion, deep Im image segmentation. There's a deep image 
segmentation paper, deep optical flow, same story. And, and this is just a little tangential. You can actually, I, I went down through the second level entries and, and looked for the ones that would be least likely to have a deep that entry paper. And they're really hard to find one which don't have a deep something entry. So geometric camera calibration, you would think that wouldn't have a deep version, but of course it does. Deep single image camera calibration, modeling into reflection, same story. Huff transform, how could that possibly have a deep neural network version? Uh, yeah, it, it does. Um, fitting lines and planes, there's a deep version. Linear filters, how could that have one? There's one, so learn filter bases in a deep network. Um, fitting probabilistic models, there's deep generative models. Anyway, just about anything you can think of. And then the one which, which really didn't have a deep version is connect. There's not a deep connect paper, but, so that's kind of a tangent. But the, the point is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a cartoon pictures of how papers were written. And so then popping up a level, um, how did this come about? Again, this is a cartoon picture, don't worry, please, uh, that the details aren't exactly correct. But in the cartoon picture, what happened was, Jan LeCun came along and he, he you know, kind of surveyed just the very first steps that we think are present in, in primate or human uh, neuroscience for vision, namely multiple layers of processing, convolutional structures within each layer, and nonlinearities between the layers. Those just those elements are, are really just the first step about uh, of neuro neurovisual science, and and he made a, a tasteful implementation of those initial that initial step in in, in the, the CNN work that he did with, that was so influential. And what was the result of taking that first step toward modeling what human vision does? The result was unprecedented academic success, just unprecedented impact, uh, both in industry and in academia, worldwide adoption of the technology. You, you, I'm not aware of any, anything that swept the world in, in the way that uh, CNN's deep neural networks have done. So here's my thinking. If you take one step in this direction and it leads to unprecedented, unprecedented success, maybe there will be some value in taking a second step in that direction too. Uh, and there are a lot of different things you can adopt, different ways you can go uh, from you know, human psychology, from uh, visual neuroscience. So that leads to, again, this is cartoon, my cartoon prediction of where, uh, where the papers for the next five years will come from, how you know, a, a generative model for generating papers from 2020 to 2025. Here it is. You pick up uh, the textbook Vision Science by Stephen Palmer. And, and this is kind of an old textbook, so maybe you want to do uh, pick up the uh, VSS uh, Vision Science Society um, annual conference uh, table of contents. But pick up one of those two and open those to a random page and look at the concept on that page and incorporate that with some thought and care into your network. And then your paper that you'll write will be titled architecture for that concept. And you'll collect the data set that highlights the need for that concept, for including that concept and gives you better results than if you don't include it. And then post your paper on archive, publish it in CBPR. So that's, uh, that's my toy model for how we'll generate papers going over the next five years. Okay, but there's one caveat, and that is presumably not every aspect of human vision is really essential for making a machine system to see. And my, my model for that, and again, this is a cartoon picture, my model for that is birds. So in the cartoon description, there's, I know there's some exceptions to this, but in the cartoon view, all birds have wings, all birds have feathers, and all birds fly. Yet somehow it seems that wings are in a special position relative to feathers that 
it feels a little bit like feathers are, are uh, obviously they're important because they're they're so ubiquitous, but they're um, they're not an essential aspect of flight, whereas wings seem to be an essential aspect of flight. And you know, one uh, piece of data for that is the fact that airplanes. We have an entire airplane industry built on winged, featherless flying machines, and and so when you look at the when you go to a random page in the human vision textbook and look at the concept, you have to distinguish whether this is a feathers concept that indeed is important for biological vision, but, but not really necessary for making a machine that sees, or whether it's wings, like really fundamental in any system that sees is going to have to have that concept. So, and as a kind of visual mnemonic to help us remember that, we note that if you take wings and put them on a person, you get a flying person. But if you take feathers and put them on a person, eh, you know, not so much. Okay, so now we come to the um, audience participation part of this talk. Now, it's a little bit awkward to do it with uh, a large audience on Zoom, but I'm hoping that you're willing to play along and willing to um, speak up, as it were. You can enter your comments on chat or you can. Um, raise your hand and, and we can call on you. It's probably simplest to, to just uh, speak and, and let us unmute you. But we I wanna go through 11 different concepts from, from human vision and have us have a little discussion. And I, I can tell you what I think, but have, it, have a discussion as to whether each of these concepts is feathers and you know, kind of optional as far as putting it into a machine that sees, or whether it's wings and really an essential aspect of any machine or any biological uh, uh, organism that sees. Okay, you ready? So now, now it's audience participation. Let's let's go to the first one. Dorsal and ventral visual pathways. So it's um, uh, it's thought and observed that in primate uh, visual system, the the visual pathway is splits fairly early into two independent streams, somewhat independent, a, a dorsal pathway, which uh, addresses where things are, and a ventral pathway, which talks about what, what is being seen. So what do you think? Is this feathers or wings? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, Vivek Goyal says, feathers. Uh, Payment thinks feathers. Um, uh, okay, and um, let's see. And if someone wants to, to speak also, maybe you can raise your hand or indicate that you have something to say beyond just the binary choice uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll unmute you. Actually, maybe um, if we could unmute Vivek, uh, who was the first person to, out of the gate, uh, maybe you can just say a few words why you think it's feathers. Let me do that. Thanks. Of course, I have to find him. <laughs> uh, let's see, where is it? Okay. Hmm. I don't see a button to unmute him. Hmm. Um, Janet, can you help? Yes. Which name is it? Vivek Goyal. Vivek Goyal. Ah, um, there we go. Hey, yes. So, hi, Bill. <laughs> um, I, I, I Feathers was my uh, gut reaction because it seemed to me the where and the what might be highly correlated and actually maybe you don't want to separate those early on because you'd get better performance by somehow, you know, leaving those two uh, together until later in some decision making process. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's actually my thought too. Uh, so, and I have comments, some comments on this one is 
you know, you might say, well, there is no right answer, but actually there is a right answer. We just don't know it yet. But anyway, um, and also I should note that some people are really emotional about these things. Like I gave this talk at a, at a previous conference and this guy came up to me uh, afterwards, just in the middle of nowhere and said, you know, really, I think it's, it's wings. I think it's wings. And um, so people, some people can get very attached to these. Anyway, I, I agree with you. I think this concept is feathers are really pretty much for the same reasons you said. I just don't see why the two need to be separated. Um, thank you. We'll try to, we'll try to make this uh, uh, discussion go uh, quicker next time, I guess. Here's another one. Explicit representation of border ownership. Now, let me set this up a little bit, although I'm going to reveal, show my hand when I do set this up. But if you go to a vision data set where they have uh, objects, the outlines of objects labeled, you might get a labeling like this for horse. Now, this is really has a problem, I think, uh, in that the ownership of the border is not represented explicitly in this labeled data set. In other words, uh, this part of the horse's boundary, I hope you can see my pointer there, like the head, that, that shape of that contour is caused by the horse. The, the, the horse owns those boundaries. It's the frontmost surface that causes that discontinuity that you see. Whereas on uh, the, the girl's leg over the horse, that really doesn't have anything to do with the horse. It's, it's, uh, it's that boundary shape is caused by her leg, not by the horse. And so if you, if you extract the horse pixels from the segmentation without taking care to note which, who owns the boundary, you get this crazy uh, data set, labeled data set for what a horse looks like. And no, that's, that's crazy. You, you want to explicitly say that the, the thick blue lines, those are owned by something else. They're not owned by the horse. The other ones are owned by the horse. And we need to take care to keep, keep that accounting in our heads as we process the image. So, okay, so I've sort of revealed to you that I think this is uh, wings. Um, but um, does anyone have any additional comment about this? Um, okay. So, so as, as I said, I think this is wings. Um, okay, let's go on. All right, contour completion. So, let's see. Yeah, this is playing now. Um, if you show this Kinesia triangle to a primate, my understanding is if you um, look at the activity in, in V2 as this crosses some cells, they will fire. There's, a, there's a, an explicit representation of this illusory contour somewhere in, our, in the brains of, of primates. And, and what about that? Is that just a... Is that an essential piece of processing images, or is that a, a, a feathers that we can do without and still make a good flying, good seeing machine? Any thoughts or comments on that? Uh, Mickey says feathers. Payment says wings. And I, I, I want to see other people talking too. Please feel free to enter your comments or, or say that you have something you want to add. There's a mix here. Um, okay. Um, I guess I want us to come up with some way that someone who wants to talk to the group is able to do so. Maybe if you, in the chat, if you indicate that you want to have something you want to say, uh, that'd be helpful to me. Okay, my thought here is that it's wings. Um, what I'm showing you in this little video is uh, part of a paper uh, I wrote with Celio and Ted Adelson, where we're trying to cal compute optical flow in this two frame sequence of a chair moving back and forth. And it's really just impossible to get anything reasonable unless you simultaneously complete contours to give a nice parsing of, of uh, what's going on in here. It's just in just looking at the image gradients and computing optical flow uh, doesn't do the trick here. So I, I believe it's, it's wings. Um, does any one of the feathers person want to give a comment? Why I think it's not necessary. Okay, let's go on. All right. 
foveation, as you all know, we have much higher resolution available to us in the center of where our eye is looking than in the periphery. Is this just feathers and uh, not really essential, or is this really a, an important part of seeing? What do you think? I appreciate those of you who are responding, and I want more to respond too. Um, ah, friendly application, feathers, feathers, feathers. Um, okay. Might be for robotics, it's wings, yes. Neil, you can choose a victim. You can choose a victim to uh, explain his answer. And how not I, me, by the way, not me. Okay, not you, fine. Um, how yeah. can I do that? If I, if I click on them, does that just say No, just say the name and we'll unmute him. Okay, fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. So, um, Majuri Mahendra Nagare, would you be willing to just say a few words? Um, yes, uh, I think this, uh, this is uh, wings for like robotics. If robot, robot is finding a way, then it needs this feature uh, as a wings. But if we are doing object detection, then it might be a uh, feeders. Okay, thank you. And I, I had a pretty similar answer too. I think um, I, I, I said it was, I felt it was wings for consumer applications, and you could argue that it's a similar story for robotic applications. But uh, feathers for academic research. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, saliency and attention. Um, what do you think? Uh, and, and Emma writes, doesn't the feathers wings concept depend highly on what your field of research values? Um, I suppose it's, uh, actually Emma, do you want to talk a little bit more about that, please? So that's Emma Reed. If you could uh, please I mean, yeah, I guess just a little bit, um, because some of the things that you've mentioned, you know, um, for, for my specific uh, sort of niche in research, I'm like, well, I guess that's feathers, you know, I don't need that or something like that. But I know that there are other people here who are diehard, you know, wings, like I need that. That is completely fundamental, right? And so that's yeah. sort of my thought about it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I have some, I have sort of the computer vision analog of the airplane industry in mind of, of, of creating a system which which looks at images the way people do, but I suppose I should be more specific and that might help with this uh, distinction. Thanks. Um, Bill, then, I, have a, I have a quick comment if you don't mind. Please. Um, it seems to me that uh, saliency and attention uh, are just sort of focusing what, uh, what our brains can take in. Like there's, a, there's kind of an information bottleneck um, as opposed to like an essential function that, that they serve. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Um, and, um, okay. Um, and then so Mendu Maji thinks um, feathers for dense prediction, wings for sparse prediction, okay. And Gregory Bazard says regarding Emily's, Emma's point, Helicopters have a much different flight mechanism than, uh, yes, than airplanes. Indeed, they do. Um, okay, and you know, as I, as I tried to uh, cut myself some slack at the beginning, this is just a kind of a cartoon framing to help us talk about things. Um, okay, so I agree that it, it's. Um, it seems like an efficiency thing, but maybe not essential for vision. What did I say here? I called it feathers. Um, but of course, people can disagree. Okay, noisy computational elements, activations represented by spikes. So that's how our brains compute. Is that really critical or is that feathers?
And Whitney says feathers. Yes. Um, Ah, and Mickey says, maybe it will be found critical when seeking energy efficient solutions. Um, um, and Majuri, uh, do you want to tell us why you think it's wings, please? So that's Majuri Miranda Nagare. Uh, I feel it is important because uh, noise can affect the decision of the network. So. I thought it's wings and it is required. Hmm. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Mickey, just we just want to talk about why this spikes would lead to energy efficient solutions. Well, um, evolution shows it, so it must yeah. serve at some point. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, there are many ways to solve the same engineering problems. So this is one path, just like before the comment about helicopters. So I'm not saying that it is feathers or wings. I'm saying that this is yet another possibility. Yeah. OK, thank you. All right. Um, here's one. Divisive normalization. So it is uh, in models of uh, early vision, modelers do a good job fitting neural data if they have this divisive normalization model where you take the responses of uh, early convolutional filters and normalize them by the, the local activity, by uh, the sum of the responses in a nearby spatial neighborhood or nearby neighborhood of orientations, and then um, scale the response by this sum of the, of the neighboring activity. Is that any thoughts about this? Yes, Payman. I'm glad you're you're uh, adamant about this one. Do you want to just say why, please? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm. What it flashed for me was that everything that we do in in uh, processing images at a very low level has to have a normalization term in it. Otherwise, uh, nothing really works. Uh, you know, we, you know, any, any black box that processes images, maps images from zero to one to zero to one or zero to 255, zero to 55. Any, any kind of reasonable computation you're gonna do has to be within some bounds. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and I think that's what I said there too. Okay. Um, Perceptual grouping. You know, we when we look at uh, figure A there on top, we we connect the um, the thing in the background across those uh, things in front of it, in a single sort of amodally completed um, representation in our heads. At least that's our subjective experience. But you also, of course, could interpret it uh, kind of segment by segment, as in B. Um, is it, you know, should we be designing vision systems that operate in a similar way? Uh, any thoughts or comments? Wings, right. So Gregory, you're so, Gregory Bazard, you're so kind to respond so often. Do you want to just say why you think this is wings, please? Uh, yeah, this is Greg Buzzard. Uh, so I, I guess I would say it's, it's similar to uh, one of the other ones we saw where the there was like a white triangle or something and our brains filled in the white triangle and you showed the video of the chair. Uh, yeah. It seems like uh, dis disambiguating these uh, objects with occlusion um, seems really vital for most processes. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I think that's what I wrote on my slides for my, my guess. Thank you. Okay, trichromacy. We have um, uh, eyes with, with three different, we have receptors with three different photoreceptor types in them. Um, are these particular types important? Is it important to have 
more than one uh, spectral filter on the world? Would a black and white camera work for vision? What do people think about that? Depends on the application, says Mickey. Uh, um, Payment says uh, feathers. Vivek says feathers. A lot of feathers with this one. Um, uh, Mark Martin says feathers since other animals differ in this regard. Right. Uh, uh, Jerry feels wings. Okay. Um, uh, Stacy Levine, I don't think we've heard from you verbally. If you're willing to say why you think it's feathers, please. Sure. Um, well, I think as terms of, um, I, I guess it is somewhat dependent on application, but we have people who are colorblind and black and white images can often give us the content that we need. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Daniel uh, Kremers, if you could please say why you think it depends on the application. If we could up, un, un, unmute Daniel, please. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, thanks, Bill. I think it depends on the application in the sense that, for example, if you want to detect where the fruit is ripe or not, uh, color plays a very important role. And often in the grayscale, this is much harder to identify. So for many applications of vision, you really want color. Yeah. For other applications, I found, for example, when you do optical flow estimation, stuff like that, it seems color is not so useful or important, but for detection and, and for example, identifying certain structures, I think color can be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. And what did I say? I said, Sai, I love color, both studying it and teaching it, but I think that it's feathers. Um, but I, but I, I guess I also I have to say I agree with you, Daniel, about what you're saying. Um, uh, some applications require hyperspectral info. Uh, the, um, uh, does anyone have something to add? Um, Okay, and Ben Whitney says feathers is is there this kind of spectral filter to magnitude process within hearing? Hmm. Yeah, so anyway, I, I do agree there are definitely applications where it's essential, but at the same time, um, there's such a broad range of spectral filtering in, in, in biology that maybe it's not essential for basic vision. And we can watch I Love Lucy reruns in black and white and it seems to go okay. Okay, uh, this one, um, power, uh, efficiency, heat dissipation, portability, uh, are these, you know, the, the brain is just this amazingly um, efficient machine. Uh, do we need to worry about those heat dissipation, uh, computational efficiency? Is that an essential part of getting a machine to see? And there's more conversations about the the um, color issue. Thank you. Um, wings. Mickey, could you please say what you're thinking about this? Sure. Um, Efficiency is always around when you are considering engineering solutions, especially when uh, they become um, more and more involved and, and, and complex. So it will become an issue. It is already an issue. We, we keep uh, evaluating our algorithms uh, by computations, uh, load, uh, memory consumption, etc. So definitely it's an issue and always will accompany us. We are improving our computing powers, but uh, we will always be in short uh, supply of uh, resources. Yes, no, I think that's an important point. And Daniel adds that it depends on the application. If you want to be lightweight and small and mobile, then it matters. Um, and what did I say? I felt it was wings for consumer applications and feathers for academic research. 
But really, I, I think I'm coming around to think it might even be wings for academic research. If you have an algorithm that takes um, three months to run, you're just always going to be a bit behind in academic research. Um, and Payman writes, embodied vision requires efficiency, so it's wings. Yes. Right, and then <laughs> when I when I think about these issues, then I, I kind of decide that probably the first words I'm going to hear from a truly intelligent AI agent are going to be something like, wait, what? As it, as it kind of wakes up from whatever sleeping it's been doing while it's been waiting for me, trying to be efficient then. Okay, and this is the last one. Um, having both feed forward and feedback network connections. So the, the CNN that, that caused the whole revolution in computer vision was a purely feed forward network, um, AlexNet and, and, and all these, these networks that do the very best at um, uh, recognizing labeled ob objects and labeled data sets, they're, they're still feed forward. Um, do you think we should be making them feedback as well? What are people's thoughts about this? So with feedback connections, you might be able to um, confirm in a kind of generative way that, that the image agrees with your top-down notion of what the image should look like. Um, any thoughts about feedback and feed-forward connections in our models? Uh, Mickey Yalad says it's, it's helpful, but isn't it basically equivalent to unfolding deep networks? And therefore, I guess the assumption is therefore not essential because you could just have a, a longer, deeper, deep network. Um, I suppose that's true. And maybe then it gets back to the efficiency argument that you'd rather spend a little bit of extra, spend a little bit of extra time computing than carry around a brain that's twice as big. Uh, I, I have a comment on this. I think this is very interesting, Bill, the, the feedback issue. The brain has significant amount of feedback, and as you say, technical solutions often are mainly feed forward. My impression is maybe we haven't fully gotten feedback structures to work properly, that there's a challenge in training them, I think, properly to actually make them work. At the same time, I think in neuroscience, it's also not fully understood what the feedback is good for. Mm. In the processing, you typically have these layers of the brain with higher level abstractions, the more you move outwards. Um, and it's not clear why, that to, at least from my knowledge, it's not clear. Some people reason it's about attention, that you can model attention with feedback, etc. So I think there is a significant value, but at least to my knowledge, it's not fully understood what exactly is, is the purpose and value of feedback in the brain. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have a comment about feedback? Um, so I guess I'm, I'm kind of willing to personally to go out on a limb on this one in the sense that even though we may not know exactly what it's doing, somehow it just seems like an important concept. So I, I feel like it's, it's, it's probably essential and, and um, but I'm saying that without, without a lot of hard knowledge actually. I guess it's just a guess. Um, so, so here we are. And, and again, remember this is a, this talk is really a, a cartoon to, to, carry, to convey a story rather than a, a detailed description of exactly how computer vision algorithms were generated in the past six years. But we discussed this toy model for how they were generated and discussed a, a new toy model for how they might be written over the next five years, which is to open a human vision textbook and look at the concepts there and, and perhaps incorporate them in our, in our models. But then again, I think not every single concept there is critical and, and it's gonna be important to 
to sort through which ones are really critical or the first or the ones that are most critical to, to bring in and um, bring them into our models. So, so my own, um, and, and you know, people have different, different opinions about which ones are feathers, which were wings. My own uh, scorecard of which are feathers and which were wings was that feathers were dorsal ventral processing, foveation, color processing, noisy spikes, attention and power efficiency. Although with the caveat that if you want real-time systems, obviously you have to take care of power efficiency. And wings were border ownership, contour completion, grouping, divisive to contrast normalization, and feedback processing. So, um, so thank you for all for playing along. It's it's uh, you know we're all learning how to do this Zoom thing together, and I really appreciated all of you who were willing to speak up and chat and so forth. Um, now I'm. I'm Happy to open it up to anyone who has a comment they want to share. Gail, uh, this is Paymon. Uh, I want to thank you again. This was this was really terrific, and uh, I, I'm I'm really impressed actually how how well it worked, uh, and people were uh, willing to participate. So uh, I just had a question. Uh, I know you've probably given this talk a few times. Uh, I'm curious to know, like on aggregate, how do you see uh, people falling on these different issues? Are they uh, uh, kind of consistent uh, on, on some of these uh, being feathers or, or wings or, or are the opinions kind of all over the place? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and I, you know, I just actually on Monday, I just gave, gave this talk to a, to a group of um, brain and cognitive science professors at MIT and, and EECS professors, we have this kind of uh, bi-weekly reading group. And, and so I gave this talk there. Um, um, so a lot of times people, first of all, kind of object to the whole dichotomy, you know, that, um, uh, oh, first of all, I had an aeronautics engineer in, in the, the talk that I gave on Monday and they pointed out that feathers were really what inspired the Wright brothers to make the shape of the wing, that, um, it's really perhaps not so much feathers and wings, but the underlying concepts behind them, like th you know, thrust and lift and so forth. Um, but if people are willing to play along with the dichotomy and say, okay, f some th essential and not essential, um, I, I guess a, a common feedback is that the people want a little bit more uh, guidance and specificity as to what type of vision system we're actually have in mind to be building. And, and and that came up in, in some of the comments today also that um, you know it depends on depends on what the application is for. If you want to uh, pick out fruit in a supermarket, then yes, you need color. Uh, whereas if you just want to move around in the world, maybe you don't need color. And 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 how how big is the box that we're going to put our vision system into also affects the answers to, to many of these questions. Um, Bill, I, I, if I may uh, jump in here, I, I found your title very intriguing, Feathers or Wings. And uh, as you say, I think a lot it depends, uh, depends on the application. And even for feathers and wings, it depends on the application. If you take a bird like the owl, the reason why you don't hear them flying is actually the feathers. Without the feathers, you would hear them. And so you can argue that for owls, feathers are very important. So, you know, even the separation of feathers and wings, whether they matter or not, depends on the application in birds. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great point. Um, I guess really the underlying point of the talk is that we have so much more to become inspired by from the biological world uh, that we should really be thinking hard about how it maps onto what we're building and how, how some of the concepts there we can bring into our own work. Um. Uh, one other question um, I had was, maybe there's an underlying theme that uh, whether, whether something is a feather or a wing, maybe it depends uh, partly on whether it enables us to build a 3D model of the world. Um, mm. um, I, I just noticed that that's not something that you have in your list here. And so I thought maybe that's kind of a meta concept that is enabled by these other things. Do, do you think there's any uh, sense to that? Let's see. Um, so, um, 
So, I, so let me understand your question better. So are you saying that building a 3D model of the world is really an essential piece? Um, yeah, so if we, if we assume that building a 3D model of the world is itself a really essential concept, you know, a wing, it, it's kind of a much bigger concept than any of these other concepts. And, and if something falls on the wing side, it means that it's enabling, maybe it's enabling uh, building the 3D model of the world. Yeah, no, that's true. And I guess that, that kind of comes back to um, kind of a, a request from the talk for, uh, you know, what, what exactly are we building? Um, mm -hmm. You could, I, I assume there are a lot of organisms in the world that do, do a perfectly fine job without building a 3D model of the world. Yeah, um, that's true too. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, if, if you want to make a machine that builds a 3D model, you really might want to have stereo vision, which I didn't even put in here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. So any other uh, comments and questions from the attendees? I just want to add that be it uh, feathers or wings, in the coming five years, we will see papers about everything here. Hmm. Yeah, that's what you get when you have 10,000 people all working together on a problem. Sure. Uh, yes. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your playing along and um, participating and uh, you know feel free to send me email if you want to continue the discussion I'm happy to talk more yeah thank you again Bill it's, it, it was great uh, and uh, I have to confess I, I've seen uh, uh, this talk before and and I, I see that it's evolved a little bit and I enjoyed it even more the second time around okay thanks a lot so thank you again okay thank you care. everyone thank you very much Bill and Pim. Thanks. thank you so much Bye. Bye.